I'm Heidi Hutner, and today on Coffee with H Times 2, I'll be talking with Bernie Krauss, a musician who now records soundscapes, natural soundscapes, and he'll be talking about that work. He's a leader in this field. Hi, Bernie. How are you? Hello, Heidi. Great to see you. So tell us what you do. What are natural soundscapes? I know it started with this idea of the wild sanctuary. Can you tell us about your journey into this work and what it is? Well, sure. I began in music. Um, my world has always been informed by sound because I don't see very well. So uh, I started off early on as a musician. And in the early 1960s, I was a member of a folk group that was pretty famous in the U.S. And then, and then and, after... And what, the, wait, wait, what was that group? It was the Weavers. I um, uh, occupied the Pete Seeger chair in that group for their last year together. Um, and then after the Weavers broke up uh, in 1964, I came out to California and learned about electronic music at Mills College, studying with Pauline Oliveris and Karl Heinz Stockhausen. And uh, during, shortly after um, uh, working at Mills, uh, I met a fellow by the name of Paul Beaver, and together we formed a group, Beaver and Krauss, bought one of the first Moog synthesizers off the line and introduced the synthesizer to pop music and film. When the synthesizer came out, there were five or six of us, uh, some on the east and some on the west coast who were using it. Uh, but we introduced it to pop music and film at the Monterey Pops Festival. And as a result of that, our, our first album for Warner Brothers was called In a Wild Sanctuary. In a Wild Sanctuary was the first album ever to use natural sound as a component of orchestration, and also the first album on the theme of ecology. So we needed to go out into the field and record natural sounds to incorporate those into the uh, material, the musical material. And that job was left to me because Paul wouldn't have anything to do with the wild. And I grew up in a family that was terrified of animals. Um, a, a goldfish was dangerous. <laughs> but but uh, uh, I got my stuff together there and, uh, and uh, got a hold of a small... A stereo portable tape recorder uh, and a pair of microphones and went out into the field, a local uh, area um, near just north of San Francisco that was a well-populated park that I thought was terribly dangerous and wild and uh, began to record, not knowing that uh, it was October and there were no animals around in October uh, because it's the fall of the year and they're gone. But I recorded, as soon as I turned on my recorder and heard the sounds through my earphones, it became clear to me that this was uh, uh, one of the most incredible moments of my life. The sound was so fabulous. It just opened up the space. And I decided I wanted to do more of that as much as I could and made the decision right then to be for the rest of my life. So... Um, uh, in a Wild Sanctuary came out. It uh, got some really good press. It sold a few copies. And it launched me on a career of recording natural sound uh, because I didn't really enjoy being in the studio closed in an office or working inside. Uh, but I did really enjoy working outside with animals. And I, at every opportunity I got, I ranged further and further afield uh, into really truly wild places uh, where no humans uh, were living and uh, just started by accident, quite by accident, a whole new field called soundscape ecology. And I've been doing that ever since. I got my PhD, by the way, in uh, uh, creative sound arts with an internship in bioacoustics. And I call myself a bioacoustician. Uh, my what I do is I work in the field of soundscape ecology, a new field which I helped found. And uh, all I do is record and analyze whole habitats, not individual animals, but whole habitats together. And uh, that's another area that I contributed some really important uh, work to. So I remember that you started a long time ago with whale sounds. Yeah. Um, one of the first things that I did as an, as an intern uh, during my um, uh, PhD um, work was to record whales in Hawaii. And I went to Hawaii to, rec to work with Roger Payne's group uh, recording humpback whales and also uh, working with um, killer whales. 
uh, known pods of killer whales, uh, both uh, the pods in the wild and pods and and the uh, members of those pods had been taken and put into captivity because I wanted to compare their vocalizations to see, uh, you know, what the differences were. And also a recording that you did where you you played the sounds of drum, what sounds like drumming, but it's internal sounds within trees. Yeah. When at, at a certain period, when trees are going through a drought period, usually in the fall, but before the rains come, uh, some trees like cottonwood, like the cottonwood tree, will um, uh, express itself acoustically, and it does that uh, because there are so many cells popping in the xylem and the phloem of the tree, uh, trying to maintain osmotic pressure by sucking in air, that. Uh, it creates a signal. It's a very high-pitched signal. And uh, we found out about that because I was recording bats in Utah. Um, and the closer that I got to this cottonwood tree, the louder the sound became. And it wasn't a, an echolocation sound that bats usually produce. It was, a, it was a constant signal. So we drilled a tiny hole into the tree and, and inserted a hydrophone, a small hydrophone that's very high pitched and recorded the signal, which was about 70 kilohertz, eh, two octaves or so beyond what we can hear, and recorded that sound. When I came back to the studio, I slowed it up by a factor of seven and got this um, this rhythmic, very rhythmic uh, sound of, of cells popping. Uh, and uh, that was what we discovered was, is that signal encourages insects lures insects into, uh, to the tree uh, because of the sap, and then birds are drawn to the tree because of the insects. And so it creates a whole micro habitat as a result of that sound. That's extraordinary. And I've, I've yeah. also, uh, I'm sorry, did you, were you gonna say something about that? No. no. So I, I've also heard you say in kind of a, uh, on a more tragic note that it's getting more difficult for you to do your recording. Can you talk about why? Well, I have a large archive of material now, um, some 5,000 hours of uh, habitats, marine and terrestrial, and about 15,000 creatures. And fully, uh, I've been recording this now since 1968. Most of the recordings come from the 80s uh, through present. And one of the things that I've noticed and it become, you know, remarkably obvious is that uh, about 50% of what I've recorded, probably more than 50% now, comes from habitats that are so radically altered by human endeavor that they're either, that their uh, voices, the biophonies have changed radically um, and e either that or they're altogether silent. Last year I recorded at a place I've been recording for 20 years and there was absolutely no bird song. It, it was um, it was the first time in my 77 years that I've ever recorded spring in a temperate area uh, with absolutely no bird song. It was completely silent. It was the silent spring. There were birds, but they weren't singing. That's really heartbreaking. Well, of course, that brings to mind Rachel Carson's famous book, Silent Spring, where she predicts that happening. Yeah. I'm sure you're seeing connections not just from toxics that she talked about, DDT and pesticides, but I, I'm guessing it's from other things that humankind uh, have been doing. Climate change well, think comes it, to mind. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's definitely climate change and global warming. Um, uh, the issue for me was that uh, spring is occurring a couple of weeks earlier here than it did when I started recording 20 years ago. So that two week change in in the window of, of vegetation is having a, an impact on the bird populations, the density and diversity of bird life here, and certainly probably other creatures as well. But I, it's mostly noticeable with the birds and the frogs. You, you talk also about the sort of slices of silence in different places and what that's telling us about climate change. Could you talk about that? I'm not clear on your question, Heidi. Well, that you go to certain places and you're hearing silence in certain areas, but not in others. Do you think that can give science clues into what's happening with climate change in particular ecological spaces? 
Well, let me back up a second and, and just describe the soundscape for a second, because it's really important to have that information. Uh, the soundscape is all of the sound that reaches our ears from whatever source. And I've taken the idea of the soundscape, which was uh, uh, generated by R. Murray Schaefer, a Canadian naturalist and composer in the late 1970s in his book, Tuning of the World. And what I did is I took the idea of the soundscape and I developed it a little bit further because I was really curious about the uh, sources of sound. Because uh, and if you don't understand the sources of sound, you're not going to understand what's happening within that whole soundscape. So I identified the sources in three areas. One was the geophony or the non-biological sounds that occur in any given habitat, wind in the trees, water in a stream, waves at the ocean shore, that kind of thing. And the second is the biophony, bio meaning life and phone again, the Greek word for sound. And uh, biophony is all of the collective sounds that occur from all the organisms in a given habitat at a given time. Um, and then the third component is the anthropophony, human noise. And some of that is controlled like music and theater and language, while most of it is uh, electromechanical and it's chaotic and incoherent. We call it noise. So a colleague of mine calls it technophony. Mm. So we've got those three different areas of, um, of, uh, of the soundscape, the three sources of the soundscape. My concern mostly is the biophony and what's happening uh, with the organisms that are vocalizing collectively in a given habitat. That is the voice of the natural world. And what's really interesting here, Heidi, is that, is that of all the major institutions in the country that teach soundscape, uh, 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 soundscape studies or environmental studies, there isn't a single institution, major institution, that teaches as a component of environmental studies soundscape ecology as, um, as a major um, uh, course or even part of the major part of the department. There are some that teach aspects of it, but none of them teach soundscape ecology as a whole. The only schools that teach anything about the sound at all tend to feature just individual organisms, uh, taking them out of context, like recording individual birds or frogs, uh, insects, mammals, and so on. And they have these huge collections that they've done over the last oh, almost 100 years now. And uh, the problem that I have with that is that when you take, when you deconstruct the natural world and take it out of con take components of it out of context, you can never put Humpty Dumpty back together again, not in any way that I know. So what's going on here is that this deconstruction, this incoherence of, of the world is the way that we've been studying natural sound. But I've taken it a different route. And when I began in 1968, um, it was my idea to just record entire soundscapes. And if you record the entire soundscape, you get a sense of, uh, of, of how that habitat is doing. You get a sense of the health of the habitat. Uh, because it's expressing that. It's a narrative of place. And if we think of it in that, in those terms, we then begin to have an idea of, of, um, of how important and vital this expression, this acoustic expression is. You know, and it's really important. I hope one of these days before I die, uh, I'll find a home for this, ar an academic home for this archive that really appreciates the range and the scope of information that this uh, the, this field of soundscape ecology is able to reveal, and and if if I can just interject one other thing here, the numbers of subjects that soundscape ecology informs are things like music, theater, language, um, uh, architecture. Yes, as far ranging as architecture, anthropology, um, uh, it's religion. Um, and just so on and so forth. There, are, I've identified like 25 of them um, in a recent book that I wrote for Yale University Press that just came out last year. So there are all kinds of ideas around this subject that are really exciting and neat and get people outside doing things that do no harm. I'm hoping to uh, encourage more to do it. Since the late 1960s, 
I have recorded more than 4,500 hours and over 15,000 species in marine and terrestrial environments. Environmental sciences that study the world we see can gain a fuller understanding from what we hear. I think this kind of work is very important as an aspect of preservation of habitats. The soundscape is the voice of a living habitat. It's extraordinary talking about this kind of idea that, number one, you're looking at ecosystems through sound. And that's an important piece, I think, in environmental studies and sustainability studies today, is that things aren't separated out. We are actually very interconnected. And to look at animals out of their systems doesn't really give us a true sense of how no. things are working. Um, I, 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 could you tell us a little bit about some of the more exciting places you've been, like a really great story you probably, you know, the most exciting place you've been where something surprised you, a country. I, I think you, you've been to Madagascar. Am I right about that? Yeah. So tell yes, us, I have. Yeah, yeah. So, so I spoke with Pat Wright, who's a colleague and a friend, and, and she was very excited about your work with, I believe you worked with her on, on, on uh, lemurs? I went to Madagascar um, hoping to actually record lemurs. Uh, and Pat was very helpful in uh, in uh, setting up the the program uh, for me there. The problem was that it rained every day, and I never really got it. rain is not really good for microphones and recorders. So I have to say that I didn't get very much uh, um, ambient sound when I, or, or lemurs when I was there. Uh, but a colleague of mine uh, did get some good material. Um, what are some other interesting places you've been to that you've done important recordings in? Well, my favorite place of all is Alaska. And uh, it's my favorite because there's maybe six, seven hundred thousand people there in a, in a place the size of New England. And uh, you can go and see probably 20 different kinds of biomes and habitats, probably much more than that. Uh, in Alaska alone, rainforests. People don't believe there's rainforests, but there are definitely rainforests up there. Uh, there's marine environments, there's coastal environments, there's uh, tundra environments, um, and and uh, boreal forest. So it really is uh, really is a remarkable, wonderful habitat to record. And I went there in 2006 to record biophonies for the first time. And nobody had ever done that before. People had gone up there and recorded birds, but they, again, they were separating them out one by one. Um, and we've got the first baseline recordings from the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge recorded in 2006, three sites. So tell us, I know that your pieces have been orchestrated, and um, can you tell us a little bit about those and how that works? I mean, how do you, are you using recordings to do that or the instruments playing the sounds to make them sound as if they're animals or soundscapes? landscape of, uh, from ecological spaces? Well, I wrote a book uh, in 2012 called The Great Animal Orchestra, Finding right. the Origins of Music in the World's Wild Places. And the book posits that we got our music from the sounds of the animal world. We learned our music from animals. They taught us to dance and sing. Um, and that book uh, it has been translated now into many languages. Uh, and uh, it's it's uh, it's a really good resource in terms of uh, kind of centering people into where we got our music and what we can use as a resource for musical inspiration. Two years ago, uh, uh oh, when my book came out, I got a call from a, Ox a composer from Oxford in the UK uh, asking me if I'd like to do a symphony with him. Uh, and uh, using my natural sounds as, again, components of the orchestration. Uh, and with a symphony played live. So we got a commission from the BBC um, to do this piece. And it was premiered two years ago at the Cheltenham Music Festival, which is the UK's equivalent of Tanglewood. Up in, it's called the Great Animal Orchestra, Symphony for, um, for Orchestra and Wild Soundscapes. It's, with a, it's wild soundscapes played live with a 70-piece 70, 70 symphony orchestra. Uh, we've had a, actually a few performances here in the U.S. this year and last, and uh, hope to get some more as well. Uh, also, um, I've done a ballet with Alonzo King Lines Ballet, which is a uh, 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 an international corps based in San Francisco, um, and it's going to be. It's been 
premiered, uh, of course, in San Francisco. It was at Jacob's Pillow last summer in New York uh, last year. Uh, and it's going to be at the uh, Palais de Chaillot. It gets its uh, Parisian uh, debut at the in, next year in uh, 2017. So this work, which is just biophonic sound, inspiring uh, dance and, and uh, orchestral music, uh, is the basis for, I guess, my next journey. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be going to Paris uh, this, uh, in about three, uh, five weeks now uh, to install the first biophonic exhibit in a contemporary art museum in the world at the Fondation Cartier uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. And they're devoting the whole museum to a retrospective of my work. That's extraordinary. So if you had one thing to, to say, I mean, I know you're a very strong environmentalist and you care a lot about our planet and what's happening with climate change. If there's a takeaway for you. Uh, let, let, me, let, me let me stop you. Let me stop you for a second here. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm no? a naturalist. OK. Uh, no. Uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton are environmentalists. So I'm, I'm a naturalist. OK. And I really I, I don't much get involved in the politics of these things, except so far as to say that most of the world is uh, that that if we want to engage with what we're doing, uh, we'll just become a more pathological nation and that not to be involved with the natural world is to increase that pathology. And so you hope people take that away from listening to your work? Yeah, sure. A sense of love for the natural world. Yeah, a, a sense of belonging to the natural world, mm -hmm. not us and it. Uh, but, you know, uh, we're very much a part of it. And the more that we respect that notion, uh, the better off we're going to be. And if, and if people don't believe that we're becoming pathological, just watch the news. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Well, thank you so much, Bernie, for coming on. And we're hoping to see your work enter a library at a major university institution where it'll be preserved and where the kind of work you're doing becomes more integrated into, into education. I think more of us need to be exposed to it. It's vital. Sound is a big part of who we are. Thank you, Heidi. Yeah, I'm thanks. looking forward to that. And we hope to bring you to our campus, okay. the Stony Brook University. So thanks, thanks, Bernie. That'll be, it'll be terrific. Thanks. Yeah, it would be. We're excited at the idea. So we're really bye honored bye. today to have a, a great, great musician and uh, soundscape uh, creator uh, of ecological history. He's really brought in what, what potentially we're, we're losing. Um, a lot of it, as, as Bernie described, is, is lost already. Um, and it's an important memory to keep and to learn from. We are part of the natural world, as Bernie described, and sound is integral to our understanding that. So I'm Heidi Hutner. This is Coffee with H Times 2. Watch more of our shows. This and others are on my website, HeidiHutner.com. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.